This video is sponsored by Jack Factory. If you need protein, pre-workout, or creatine, any one of those three fundamentals, links are in the description. I highly recommend it, and of course, it helps support the channel. I think I got some today. I'm just looking for a bench PR. By the way, I heard you haven't hit one in quite a while. Yeah, your friends told me. Got the whole squad laughing. But comment below, what is your bench press max? And if it is a touch and go bench, subtract 15 pounds off for me just to keep it real. And the point of this is that we have the best bench presser of all time in today's video. And every time I feature someone who is the best ever, I want people to see a range of what is actually normal. So there is no number that's too low to share below. In fact, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Now to go into just how great our guest is, we have to look at bench press history. The first bench press world record was in 1898 by George Hackenschmidt, who invented the supine press. It was just over 350 pounds. Then the 500 pound barrier was broken by Doug Hepburn in the 1950s. Surprisingly, the 600 pound barrier was already broken in the 1960s. That would still be an incredible bench press today. And it was broken by Pat Casey. It took until 1996 for the 700 pound barrier to finally go down. And that was by James Henderson. Time to put 600. If you, if you scared of it, let me know. A lot of times I have to tone my workout down for my spotters. <laughs> I don't understand. The most fascinating thing about this is after the 700 pound barrier was broken, there were very small increments in the world record. Eric Spoto overtook it, then Kirill overtook it, but it was an 18 year period of a 28 pound increase. Whereas the past six years, the world record has increased by 44 pounds due to our guest. So he has basically defied diminishing returns if you look at humanity as one big system. So without further ado, our guest is the first man, potentially, to bench press 800 pounds, Julius Maddox. Okay, today's video is a very special one because we have the strongest bencher ever, the biggest bench press in history. We've had Dan Bell who had the biggest total, Ray Williams who's had the biggest squat, and now you complete the trifecta, although we will have the biggest deadlifter on later, but that's all it's going to yeah. be. So you're in an elite list here, uh, which I'm sure you already know. So first of all, thank you for coming on. We have Julius Maddox here. What's up? What's up? Yeah. So first, what I want to ask you is, what did you bench press in high school? I want to say like 285. 285? Really? Yeah, really? but I was 185 pounds also, so... Um, Wait, are you saying I mean, 285 pounds, right? At you yeah, bench 285 likes. at 285. But you're are you saying yeah. senior year in high school? Uh yeah, I think it was my it was my senior year. Really? Jun, it was junior. It was my um the summer my junior year summer. So going into really? my senior year. Okay. You see, I I would have thought it would have been more just based off genetics alone. Oh, uh, no. Really? Nope. nope. That's fascinating. So, nope. what was the uh what was the first time you benched Let's say four oh five. I would say in two thousand and eleven. Two thousand eleven. So how old were you at that time? Uh twenty two thousand eleven. Twenty four maybe. Twenty four, twenty four. That's interesting. So when you were coming up, um, what sports did you play? Uh, I mean basketball, uh, football. Mm -hmm. I pl I ran track. Uh, not only ran track, believe it or not, at three hundred pounds, but uh, really? through shot put. I was gonna yes. ask that. <laughs> yeah. yeah shot so, so what? How uh, how far did you throw the shot put? By the way, my furthest was fifty eight feet. Damn. Was that in, yeah. was that in high school? In high school, wow. I went to state my senior year, and that was just basically off pure strength. There was no technique. There was no, um, I didn't really understand when it came to, uh, you know, doing the shot put. Because there's technique yeah. to it. They can yeah. give you extra, you know, two to three feet, you know. Yeah. But I just, did, you consider, yeah, did you consider playing sports in college? Yeah, but I was just, I was already wrapped up in the lifestyle. The lifestyle was mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, you know, drugs and money and, you know, sex. And that's what I prioritized. That's where my yeah. priorities were at. Yeah, you have probably the most 
unique life path of uh, really of any high level elite lifter. So actually something that I'm unaware of is how did you find out about powerlifting and how was that related to your um, recovery and, and transition into a healthier lifestyle? For those who are unaware of Julius, um, you know, he used to have issues with addiction, with drugs, and then completely you know, turned your life around. So at, where was powerlifting in that mix? And just how did you find out about powerlifting? Well, um, I found out about powerlifting through um, a friend of mine that mm -hmm. later on became like basically my uh, uh, my right hand man when it came to, um, you know, traveling and competing and training and things like that. But it was actually one of the counselors at the recovery program that I was at. Really? So I would go down to the basement after work and go work out. And I did that for about seven, eight months straight. Uh, and, you know, started getting stronger. Didn't really pay attention yeah. to it because, you know, I was just in it just to feel better. Uh, yeah. Cause it seemed like it would clear my, my, my mental state and, and put me in a better mental state. Yeah. So it would just clear my mind. And, uh, and all I did, I did the same thing just about every single day I worked out, uh, did, uh, 225 bench press, three sets of 10 overhead press, three sets of 10, um, yeah. bent over rows, three sets of 10 and, uh, maybe some curls, three sets of 10. And I did that every single day for about, you know, anywhere from five, six days a week, the same training routine. Wow. Um, I was in the basement, uh, like, like where we, where we got to. Wait, can I, can I just ask a quick question is when you say yeah. every single day, do you mean the same exercises or just three sets of 10? And then was it benching one time a week or were you benching oh, literally the five day, times? The same, the same exercises wow. every day. <laughs> Wow. Every day. Now, give or take, I might have missed a day in between every yeah. now, but it wasn't common. Yeah. Like, that, I, I very do, rarely missed it because that's what we did. We, uh, that's fast. What I was just going to say is what's absolutely fascinating to me is that is exactly what Ray Williams said is that he used to squat every single day and not intentionally. It was just because he was just like, all right, I guess this is what I do. So it's very fascinating that both of you guys had that start. And do you think I, that I helped you at all, though, by having it blasted you know, that hard? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think just at that time, because I wasn't placing mm -hmm. it, the, the load wasn't heavy enough to, to do yeah. that much, uh, on my central nervous system. So I was able to recover a lot faster. No given days I would be sore, but you know, just like sports in high school, you learn to like play through the soreness mm -hmm. and you get stronger. So that was like the concept of it. Uh, but the higher the, the intensity became, it was just like, you know, there's no way. Like, once I started training yeah. under Josh Bryant in 2015, uh, 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. um, once I started training under him and under structured programming, there was no way I could I could do the same exercises five days a week, six yeah. days a week. Yeah. It was just so, considering the load wasn't as heavy, um, I was able to do that every day. And then, uh, you know, I did that, like I said, for like six months, seven months straight. And one day we were just down in the gym. I, I had never went over 215. Well, mate, mm -hmm. I take it back. I went to 265, 275 at one point, and I was doing like maybe like set like three or four sets of five because I had no clue what I was doing. Yeah. And uh, one day we were just down in the basement, and somebody, you know, it would be a group of us guys down there, and um, somebody was like, "I bet you can lift every single weight down here in this basement." <laughs> and you know, I was like, "Me being me, I'm like." We'll throw the weight on there. Let's see. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put all the weight on there. We added it up after the lift, of course. Um, not very smart, but it ended up being 505 pounds, and I did it for like three reps. Wow. And just they were blown away. So they went and told one of the counselors, like they were talking. They were like, you know, Julius hit 505 pounds for mm -hmm. like a set of three. And he's like, he had he was already familiar with power lifting, and he knew about C.T. Fletcher and um, and he knew about, you know, like Dan Green and Pete Rubbish mm -hmm. and all these guys. Uh, and uh, he was like, man, you really? And he showed me a few videos of some guys. And I started, that's when I started looking up C.T. Fletcher and um, learning about like Larry Wills and and, and, uh, and uh, um, Larry, uh, uh, my, my guy, Larry, uh, I mean, uh, Elroy, Leroy, Leroy Walker. I call him Uncle Elroy, but um, <laughs> learning about these guys. <laughs> learning about these different guys and I was like, you know, 
it'd be cool one day to do that, but I don't think that I had that type of potential. Yeah. Um, and I probably two months after that moment, I did my first meet and I bench pressed, I maxed out at 525. Wow. And then soon after, maybe like eight months later, six months, maybe not even that long, maybe four months later, I went to a meet. And I hit 625 pounds on a bench press. Wow. Maybe it was like six months later, six to seven months later. That's incredible. So I went from 525 to 625 in a matter of like six to seven months. Wow. So how old were you at this time? 25. 25. Wow. <laughs> well, no, actually, the 625 pound bench press was whenever I was 20. I was 25. I was 25. Maybe. Wow. Maybe 26. Yeah. It, who, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I was 25 or 26, one of those numbers, one of those ages. Yeah. But um, and there is like once I, but it seemed like once I hit 625, that's where my wall was set. Because it took me, even training under Josh, it took me about, I'd say, to get to 650, mm-hmm. it took me almost a whole nother year to get there. Wow. 650. So, um, and of course that, that 620 was a, it was 620. It was a touch and go. Um, but I was able to pause 650 at another, at another meet. So, um, yeah, that's basically how I went. Yeah. So, um, during this process, you basically built up just keeping it very simple and high volume overall. Right. So is there any, were there any accessories early on that you felt really carried over that maybe didn't carry over as much later on? Cause I, I want to add some perspective here is let's say, let's imagine someone's watching this. I think a lot of people relate to me because I'm you know more similar to them. Even if I like my squat 625, you know, which is good, but it's still like they can kind of relate. I think your bench yeah. now is so strong that it's, it's almost like a, a deadlift, right? And in some yeah. respect, as far as just the absolute fatigue that you're putting on yourself. So earlier on, were there certain things that just really clicked that maybe now aren't specific enough for someone who's handling such incredible weight? Uh, I, I, I didn't think I needed to go as heavy on incline presses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, a lot of, if you don't, if you train heavy incline presses for a long period of time, without substituting other um, exercises, uh, then I, I just think that creates a lot of mileage and yeah. you start to get uh, problems in the shoulder area. So yeah. um, learning that and, you know, which I'm, I'm saying like I can, I can, I can incline, heck, probably 650, 700 pounds but, to be all the way transparent. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's just, it's not beneficial. Yeah. So it's, earlier on, did it did it help a little bit, and then just later on, it's like no. I can't. I can't tell you. Yeah. I can't tell you if it carried over. Um, I'm sure it did. I think one of the main exercises that carried over that I, I always uh, leave out, mm-hmm. and, and it's similar, but a standing landmine press. Really? Yeah, that's interesting. Standing landmine presses. I think it's different than an incline is because you can use your leverage. So where an uh, incline is basically brute strength. Um, which uh, 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 the uh, landmine press is brute strength, but you're able, you're able to use your legs so you can get that kind of extra oomph, you know, um, to be able to push through. But I think overall, that's probably one of the most, um, I think between those and pushups. And I've said this previously before. Yeah. I was going to say, I read about you saying that. Oh yeah. They're about, and I don't know why I got away from them. Like last training block, I haven't, I didn't do either one of them and I was still successful, but Mm -hmm. I feel that landmine presses and push-ups and a combination of those two on your second uh, bench day it c- can really help with uh, create explosive uh, explosivity when it comes mm-hmm. to bench press. So how did you specifically, like within a week, let's say, a given week, we'll see a young Julius here going from, let's say, you know, you just broke 600 to now you're going to 650. How would you set up doing push-ups in a way that's you know, going to really give a meaningful effect? Because it's like a lot so of people my, watching that, you may not know what to even set that up. Yeah. So basically how I structure programs whenever I do programs, I do cookie mm-hmm. cutter programs. It's simple for, for basically everybody to follow. But um, I would set it up on a day where the load isn't going to be as heavy. So it would be your second bench day. Mm-hmm. Um, and because I don't think – I think anything over two bench days is going to be counter – 
I would say counterproductive. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the right word for, for that sentence, but uh, for, for helping well, explain that. But anyway, um, I don't think it's, it's as beneficial it be simply because um, you're not given enough time, not just your muscles, but you're not giving your central nervous s- system enough time to recover. So mm-hmm. if you're benching, even if you're benching at 70, uh, even if you're benching between 70 and 85% on both of those days or give or take either, either, either day and you're throwing in squats and deadlift and you're working a job. Yeah. How does that even, how is that even beneficial for you? Yeah. So with that being said, those two days of bench days, if if it's over, if it's over two bench days, then I think it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's pretty, I don't, I think some people could, uh, some people could benefit from it, but it's going to be very short. It's going to be yeah. a short lift time. Yeah. But, uh, how I would structure it is okay. I would go basically start the week with bench press. Um, we work up to a top set, then we do back down sets, all depending on um, on, on percentages. Then uh, we uh, right after that we'll go into accessory work. Um, so we target the muscles that were used uh, in the bench press, basically your mm-hmm. triceps, uh, your back, um, and uh, of course your chest and your. Uh, your bi- your biceps, so mm-hmm. those major um, uh, groups that are that we kind of yeah. so what, when you do with the pushups though specifically like what what well, I have two questions is first of all what sets and reps on the pushups and then second of all are you talking loaded pushups as well or are you doing all unloaded pushups I don't think loaded at the I think if you're if you're like a novice or you're just starting beginning I don't think you should do weighted or loaded push-ups because I mean you think about it uh beginners can barely do five push-ups yeah. you know but I was I was going into it so from the bench day um usually we do a back day leg day then back around the chest day again mm-hmm. and on that day I would I would probably program it just depends uh but most likely I would start out with push-ups and for the first week if you're so say someone's coming in like look I want to start this routine where do I incorporate push-ups I would say yeah. you need to do the push-ups first and you would do you would start out with doing maybe um, five sets of five uh, I would just keep it very simple and basic make sure you're focusing on form um, and really being explosive out of uh, uh, f- being explosive from off the floor mm-hmm. so as your chest is touching the floor your 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 state of mind should be as explosive as possible yeah and um, once I start, once I did the five by fives, usually uh, once I completed those for, I'd probably I'd probably do five by fives for the first month just to get acclimated to it, and then I would start pyramiding down. I would start working up to like um, I would I got me personally I got into mm-hmm. doing it where I was doing ten sets of forty push ups in an hour. Of, <laughs> ten sets of forty. Damn. Now, given the, those push ups were. Uh, 25 of those push-ups were piston push-ups. Mm-hmm. So still I guess I'm kind of all over the place, but kind of explaining it. But no, you're good. Whenever I increased uh, uh, volume in push-ups, mm-hmm. I started incorporating piston push-ups, and um, it's almost like a form of time under tension yeah. because there's doing piston push-ups. There's no point of rest. It's just quick, mm-hmm. quick short bursts from off the ground uh, to about, you want to give about six inches of, of leeway. And then the last 15 reps, you're going to fully extend. Those are probably, those have humbled. So I've had guys that, that, <laughs> that swore to me that they could complete this. And I haven't seen a person yet that can complete 10 sets of 10. I mean, 10 sets uh, of 40 push ups doing half piston push ups. Yeah. So, yeah, I believe it. That's got to be tough. Oh, it, 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 it's crucial. But these are just tricks that I've learned to – I'm not going to say trick the muscle because I don't really believe in tricking the muscle, but mm-hmm. to, to add that extra stimulus on the muscle because yeah. of uh, the time under tension and um, doing them in that manner, in that fashion. Yeah, you know, you know so. what this reminds me a lot of too is that uh, – do you know of Jason Mike? He's the Mike, uh, – Mike. Yeah, Jason, J- Jason Mike, yeah, he's the best IPF he or he at least the last time he competed yeah, at the world stage, he was the best IPF drug tested bencher. 
Um, and he actually had a setup that was, it really reminds me a lot of this. Now it's a little different, but where he would bench 225 and do 100 cumulative reps and then just do as few sets as you possibly can. So when you're doing four sets of 10 on push-ups, uh, I forgot if you said it in the mix there. Are you doing push-ups one time a week at that point or multiple times a week? Yeah, no, just one time a week. These are one all time, one okay. time a week. So uh, for the first for the first two to four weeks, I would do five sets of five. Okay. Okay. So then you can, then you can kind of uh, go from there. So the best mm -hmm. way to gauge it, um, I would say, is start doing – um start with 10 sets do it 10 sets of five and every week go up so the mm -hmm. next week will be 10 sets of six 10 sets of seven 10 sets of eight as the weeks progress oh. you're just going to go up yeah. on how many reps you're doing when it comes to push-ups so i've worked up to 40 40 10 sets of 40 push-ups wow and so that, that's really and, smart oh, how it's very gradual Oh, yeah. yeah. And you want to ease into it, but really, think about it. This is in an hour. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. kicker. An hour. Damn. So, um, oh, it's rough because you think about it. When you're doing push-ups like that, like your muscles are cramping yeah. up. And, yeah. you know, trying to figure out a rest time. So, um, what, I, what I found I did was I would do my push-ups between sets. And it mm -hmm. kind of helped where I'm doing like uh, other things, uh, didn't matter whatever it was, but it just helped doing those push-ups like that. Yeah. Kind of spread a little bit. Yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so now but, yeah. L let me uh, ask you about your current training right now. So first of all, how much or how often in a week do you bench press just right now, competition bench? Flat bench once, once a week. Once a week. Okay, mm -hmm. so you flat bench once a week. Do you do uh, another pressing day? On the second, do you have a secondary day or no secondary it's, it's, day? Yeah, the second day, it depends. It's accessory day, but sometimes mm -hmm. it could be dumbbells. Um, now we're, we're going back to incorporating push ups and landmine presses mm -hmm. for my second uh, pressing. Yeah. So I, I might do some dumbbells also, but for the most part, it's going to be focused on uh, push ups and um, push ups and uh, standing landmine presses. Okay, so I mean, when you. Yeah. In your training right now, do you use percentages currently, or do yes. you do you ever use RPE, or are you a percentage guy? We're we're basically uh, percentage percentage based. Percentage based. I'm just I, I think uh, so. Whenever I report back, I report in RPE. Mm -hmm. But in sense. the beginning, but we're basically um, basically it's just percentage based, unless it's accessory work. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, how? You now I know this, this is very. Tough to ask because it's very situational, but I, I believe I've seen you do up to seven sets in a given workout, right? You, you've had, you still train with I've like five ten, to seven. You've done 10 sets? Yeah. I've done 10 sets of 550 for five reps. Wow. <laughs> 10 sets of 550. Yeah. That is uh, insane. It was, yeah, it so, and that's under Josh Bryant, right? Because I know he trains uh, you know, people really hard and he has a lot. I, I would actually say, from what I've seen on the untested side, there are some guys who really train the competition lift very sparingly. And then a lot of times kind of the IPF guys are known as training with a lot of volume on the competition lift. But from what I've seen with your guys' training, with you and Josh Bryant, it seems like you guys really have a lot of that meat and potato. You're saying five to, to seven sets to sometimes 10 sets on the competition bench. And um, first of all, do you find that... Uh, do you think that more people on the untested side would fare better if they did train with more volume? Uh, or do you think they train with more volume than I'm thinking? Well, you say untested. So mm -hmm. um, the only thing that I've ever been on was testosterone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I didn't start taking testosterone until, what was it? Summer of 2019. Really? Wow. Yeah. So I hit 716 pounds. Completely natural. Actually, really? my testosterone wow. was was below 300. Wow. And I made a post about it. People didn't believe me. You know, they're like, ah, oh, you can fake the test and all this stuff. And I'm like, why would I need to fake a test? But So were you, were you uh, drug tested at that time at the competition? No, the only one that, that I went to that was going to drug test mm -hmm. was RPS. And at the time, they told us they didn't have any tests available. 
the, one of the main reasons why I didn't compete in any uh, drug tested federations, besides one, I think I hit like 640, but uh, that was a long time ago. But um, it's because I'm all about the culture of the meat. I don't want to go to a um, I don't want to go to a meet and it's like uh, competing in a library, you know, where people yeah. really there's no tenacity, <laughs> there's no um, they're, they just they're just lackadaisical. I call it like tiptoeing through the tulips, mm-hmm. um, and and where people aren't you know, and I, I did those and I was like I'll never do it again, mm-hmm. and uh, that was a drug tested meet. I think I, maybe I hit six sixty at that meet, but anyway. Um, that's actually, but that is a fascinating point that you're bringing up there, because I, I did, really did not expect that. And what I was going to say is like, because actually this is a question I have for you later on down the road, and now I think I know the answer, is it was if you think the gap between, like the IPF, if you look at their squat versus untested squat, it's basically the same. Like guys like Ray Williams and Jez Oepa can squat with the best of them. But when you look at the bench press, there's just this gigantic gap between the best IPF bench pressers and the untested side. And what I was going to ask you later on is if you think that's more cultural than maybe people are thinking that maybe the expectations are so low for some reason on the IPF, on the bench press side of yeah, super I heavies. Think, like I said, I would have hit a, if I, if I would have competed in IPF, I would have hit a 700 plus bench in IPF right. at any given moment. But simply because of their rules and mandates, I'm like, I've had people that lifted in those federations and they hate it. They hate yeah. lifting in some of those federations. I'm not necessarily pointing out the IPF, but I'm just saying mm-hmm. like the ones where they make you basically, you have to lift in their federation or you get fined if you do certain things. And, yeah. and I'm like, I, I had people that would complain to me about it. And I'm like, no, I, I don't, I don't have to, this is not one of those things where I have to, do this because everybody else is doing it. I didn't have to lift at a drug, untested meat because everybody else did. Mm-hmm. I didn't care. I just cared about getting strong, being stronger, and putting up the numbers. Mm-hmm. I didn't really think it was a big deal. You got to think about it. I've only been in, I've only been like seriously powerlifting for five, five and a half, six years. Mm-hmm. Like really into it. You know, my first real meet, well, I think was like, I want to say in the end of my first real meet was in like two, 2015, like yeah. where it was an actual sanctioned wow. meet. <laughs> So um, I'm, I was fairly new to the sport. I didn't know about federations. I didn't know mm-hmm. about any of that. Even whenever I started to find out about it, I just wasn't intrigued because I had a wife at home, four kids, mm-hmm. um, three, uh, two part-time jobs and a full-time job. I didn't. The only thing I focused on was just lifting weights and getting stronger. I didn't know any lifters. I didn't really start knowing who who's the who's over mm-hmm. the past two years of powerlifting. Yeah, so uh, one question I have for you now extending off of this is – are you at all concerned about the temptation of going further down the rabbit hole of going like, okay, so you just take a little test here, but then what if, well, see, I guess you're in a, you're in a good, good position right now where you really are blowing by everybody. I mean, you are dominating the bench press, but let me ask you a hypothetical. Let's say someone comes around, let's say Kirill comes back, bench is 805. Would you ever get to a point where you go, okay, I'm going to use a little bit of extra uh, because it's within the rules anyways. Would you do that? Uh, if you know he's I, using a lot too, let's let's say that. The reason too. why I say that, the reason why I say that, I mean, don't get me wrong, the the thought has is coming has has mm-hmm. ran across my mind, but uh, man, I'm. If you really know me, you'll know that when it comes to principles and standing on your principles, uh, like I'm just not gonna waver. So if it's mm-hmm. illegal, I'm not gonna do it. I'm mm-hmm. just not gonna do it. I'm not going to put myself or my family in a position to even I have to be above reproach. I'm mm-hmm. just saying I know I should like I'm a little different the way I think. But if say I was going to meet someone, this is how paranoid I get because I've lived this game. Mm-hmm. Say I was going to meet someone to get some drugs or get someone to get some in the mail, whatever the case may be. And that's what I got busted for was trafficking prescription pills and 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 prescription pills and drugs through the mail. Yeah. So um what happens if you know everything that I've done to get me to this point, not just invested in powerlifting, but what about what I've invested in outside of powerlifting, where I go to high schools and um, I'm character coach of the football team and um, I, I, I do weekly meetings at the middle schools and things like that. Mm-hmm. And So what happens when Julius's name is tarnished? For me, it's not worth it. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so if Corel comes along and benches 805, then, yeah. hey, more power you, to him. You know, what, you know what the internet's going to say, though? I, I guarantee you these are what the comments are going to say. Because <laughs> what, if, what if someone comments, well, that's an incentive to say you're not using. <laughs> what if they say that? Then, like, oh, that's to protect the job, this or that. But to be clear, we didn't even, you don't even have to talk about any of this. So, Listen, so yeah. I was so skittish about taking testosterone. Mm-hmm. It took me three months to finally say, all right, I'm going to get on it. And the mm-hmm. only reason why is because in that season, I almost had a nervous breakdown, like a mental breakdown. Really? Um, just had everything going on. I'm like, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I stayed pressed out. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't feel like I was making any leeway, getting any stronger. And I got to the point to where I was just about to, I, I, like me and my wife, were we, were we were on hard times. And I just wanted to pack my stuff up and leave. I was, you know, I've always been a family-oriented man, yeah. even whenever I was out there. But I thought about just packing my stuff up and leaving. And mm-hmm. that was just a uh, time where I was just trying to figure out what was going on. I called Josh Bryant one night. Um, this was uh, 2018. Mm-hmm. 2018, December 2018, right before Christmas, I had called Josh Bryan. I told him, I said, man, I don't know about this. I think I'm, I'm, think I'm done. Something wow. is going on with me, and I don't know what is going on. And he had said, um, oh, it's probably just stress and all this stuff. And, you know, we just continued to carry on, and it just got worse. So um, he advised me to go get my blood work done. He's like, when's mm-hmm. the last time you got your blood work done? I'm like, I don't get my blood work done. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, he was like, go get your blood work done. Well, my test levels were under 300. And I had been competing wow. on up until summer of 2019 on uh, with my test levels at extremely low. Yeah. So once wow. I got on, but anyway, people can say what they want to say. At the end of the day, I, I don't care. You know, I, I really <laughs> I really, you know what I mean? Like, I really yeah. don't care. And you'll never convince, you know, there yeah. there will always be people who have their minds made up. And because even I've accepted that, like, the funniest part is that there's so many level shifts where there there have been full articles saying I am not natural. <laughs> By the way. Like, just. And that's what I'm saying. It's, it's like, yeah. that, that's what one of the reasons why I was like, man, I mean, it's not one of the. Uh, yeah, basically, it's one of the reasons. Like, people already think I'm people already think I'm, I'm, I'm on test anyway. They probably think I'm on God knows what. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to tell you, I don't even know what anabolic steroids could give you the most. Stress. I'm just being serious. Like mm-hmm. I, I'm uneducated in that yeah. area. Like I have no idea other than testosterone. Um, I'm just, I just never put any attention or any energy towards it because I'm like, uh, what's the whole point of benching 800 pounds if I die at 40 or if I die yeah. at 35? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I actually, mean? I, actually, one question um, <laughs> is now on this topic is uh, you did a seminar with Louis Simmons, I saw. When you yeah. hang around guys like that, who, I know Louis is very, he's very assertive in getting the most possible. And I know he's big into like every athlete, you know, realistically should, should be on kind of for life. Like he's kind of implied. Now, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he's definitely just very aggressively on that side. Have you ever had peer pressure by other coaches of like, okay, get with me, do this, this, and this, and I'll oh, take you I here? Oh, I can't tell you how many people have – look, me and Josh, like I said, once we got mm-hmm. together, we, we've been like this. He's like a, he's like a second yeah. father to me. That's awesome. So, um, man, like he's been with me through the hard times, you know, and it's like we're winning. Yeah, That's like Jordan <laughs> winning. And like Jordan's like in the middle of it like, look, I'm out of here, guys. You know, I'm not carrying the torch, but – like I'm literally, I'm going to another team, and 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 we're gonna. No, it just doesn't work yeah. like that. You know, yeah. uh, when he was in his prime, I know later on in the year, but when he was in his prime, he wasn't thinking about leaving the the Bulls, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, why would I even if thing everything's working? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, if it what is it? If it ain't broke, yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, I don't know why it sounds kind of funny, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, but um, that's kind of where 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 my mind, where my state of mind is, and it's. Uh, so I, I can't tell you I can't sit here and tell you that I haven't thought about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have whatever's going to give me the advantage, but it's like what I'm doing now is working. Yeah, like I'm I'm still progressing. I haven't yeah. hit that wall where I'm like scratching my head thinking like what the heck is next. Yeah, you know yeah, you're not even close to that wall. I mean even because your your best in competition is in the seven eighties, right? Due to 780s. Um, 
and 782 yeah so it's like even if you just hit that that 800 pound you have know, bench which we'll talk about by the way fairly soon here about the espn situation and the fact that you know, actually let's just talk about that now is how did you mentally deal with the fact that you were on espn attempting an 800 pound bench press and then the spotter or one of the loaders sorry screwed up so how, how did you mentally deal with that have you forgiven the whole situation Absolutely. like how do you move that's, on from that's, that and that's what's different about me and that's why i don't really mm-hmm. care about who cares if i'm what i'm taking or what i'm on simply because this fact alone mm-hmm. my identity is not in powerlifting. my identity is not being the strongest bench presser on the world my mm-hmm. identity is who i am in christ and who i am in my, uh, as a father mm-hmm. who i am in my community so therefore when things go wrong i understand that people mess up i understand that people make mistakes I've made plenty of mistakes. Will you say, how can you make a mistake on TV? <laughs> yeah, that was a big mistake. <laughs> that was a big mistake. What, but we've learned a lot. I mean, like, mm-hmm. it's almost it's almost like it's a law of the universe. Whatever mm-hmm. is going to go wrong will go wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 you know, it's happened. And I understand it. Ha- I, what type of athlete would I be if I blamed, if I – you know, flipped out and started flipping stuff and tried to fight people. Like what message is that setting for the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. What message is that that setting for my community? So some people, uh, uh, look at it like, Oh, you're being pseudo humble or not, but this is what it is. And you know, because of that lift and the misload, we are now, um, the Chicago Cubs organization picked up, the next 800 pound lift really oh yeah like wow. this is, it's gonna be a wrigley wrigley field i didn't even know about this has this been has this been publicly announced <laughs> oh yeah so we haven't really yeah, it's I kind of been it. because of covid mm-hmm. um and the baseball bubble that they've been in like just like basketball where they're kind of still keeping people quarantined yeah um we haven't we're trying to figure out to make sure the dates were gonna align right Man. So um, this week, everything should be finalized, contracts, and all that. It's already wow. written up. Uh, we already have the agreement. We're just going through red lines to make sure uh, whatever disagreements are in there, discrepancies. But, yeah, Wrigley Field. Awesome. Who, who would ever thought that it would be <laughs> at, at, a, at a national baseball game where the, the, the marquee network is picking up my next lift? So That's I think incredible. this is far much bigger than ESPN. Um, yeah. And a, a national baseball organization picked up my actual uh, it's never been done before so yeah. which brings me to the next point is what what i'm doing and and, and this is what's so great this is why i get angry i don't get angry but it just it just frustrates me when people for example the iranian lifter just posted a video 717 mm-hmm. pounds um his name is daniel we talk frequently in messaging um i fully support him but this is bigger than just a, a gym lift or a, 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 how I'm looking at it. Like mm-hmm. people don't understand. And they're, they're so what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is everybody's trying to put everybody against each other. Right. Mm-hmm. Trying to put each lifter against each other. That's what people want to see. I'm trying to unite everyone yeah. because what I'm trying to do for powerlifting is monetize it for everybody to start getting paid for the work that they've been put in. Uh, all these uh, these me- these 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 uh, organizations, um, they they prostitute out. Of, they prostitute not just organizations but brands. They prostitute out all these athletes, give them very minimum. Yeah. And you know, whenever they're hurt, they're hurt. Once they get once they once they get their use out of them, they wash their hands and move on. Yeah. Okay. And uh, <laughs> that's so true. So that's that's why I get frustrated when people tag me in or come and say look he's coming for you or he's on your neck or like i support this guy totally i support any lifter but bro do uh, don't don't bring it to me until it's done at a competition mm-hmm. until it's actually in the books um and, and everybody wants to always everybody want everybody always wants to cause division instead of unifying because yeah. i believe if we unify powerlifting it can be just as big as wwe or wwf yeah. whatever the case may be uh uh they they stream these 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 events on espn croquet and and, and and yeah um what's the one where they hit the ball off the horse um polo and yeah all these other different sports they monetize 
And I think powerlifting is more exciting than just just about a football game. Or, yeah. you, I mean, like powerlifting when it comes to meets, it, it powerlifting the sport of powerlifting will have you at the edge of your seat, ready yes. to lose your crap <laughs> over you know whether a lift is completed or a total a, a, a record for an all time world record or a total. Like so, with that, I mean, I know I'm kind of rambling on, but that's just the picture that I see. This is like, great. Now this, dude, this bigger. is like, yeah, and we've we have not even talked that much. And the funny thing is, like, you're talking to someone who I could not agree more. <laughs> like this is literally like we have exactly the same perspective on a lot of things. Because first of all, I don't know, are you familiar with the fact that the USAPL bans the use of cameras even at nationals now, so that then you have to buy a media. Um, package and then you get like you'll get it oftentimes like three weeks later and then I did this and it was just from one tripod didn't move at all and then when I backed up to deadlift I was like a little speck on the screen and I just got screwed out of that so it was like actively hurting the lifter by making them have to buy this rather than seeing the bigger picture and on top of that is basically that's your accomplishment you mm -hmm. worked for that did, yeah. they, did they pay you money did they pay you to lift <laughs> no, yeah, not at all. Like they, and not, not yeah, it, it really is like, it's, it's exactly what you're saying is I think it does come down to money and opening up competition because or else they will not try it. Like what's funny is I actually made a video mentioning, you know, the USAPLs, you know, they also have a lifetime membership now, which then gets you into nationals. If you have the qualifying total and you buy a lifetime membership, you get ahead of the line. So if you pay twenty five hundred bucks, like it, it really is ridiculous. Politics. It's all about money, man. Yeah, it's, it's, man, these are these are schemes. But that's when when a guy explained some of those things to me about how mm -hmm. he, like he had uh, one of my buddies had um, he had got an inhaler because he has mm -hmm. asthma. Well, they stripped him of his title of his world title, and not only that, but they made him pay like eight hundred bucks. And banned him for like three, three to six months or something like that. Eight months maybe. Wow. And it's like um, that sucks, man. Yeah. That I could tell what that did to his spirit, and I'm just like mm -hmm. that. But that was the main reason in that season was the main reason why. Like, why would I go to a federation for them to take basically prostitute me out? Yeah. What yeah. they're doing? I mean, yeah. That's, that's all it is. Is they're prostituting athletes, and I don't care what federation. If your federation charges all these fees and they're limiting people from being able to get the footage and not only get the footage, they're not giving it necessarily back to the athlete. Yeah. Then all, right. all they are is just they're, they're making their pockets fatter. You know, yeah. like, it's not about yeah. You know, what's wild, too, is that I actually got an email back from the USAPL and they they implied I'm selfish <laughs> like in my. Yeah. Like they they're that nasty. Selfish. Yeah, they, they said this is a nonprofit. So we're first of all, nonprofits can literally make money. Like that doesn't mean that no one's making money. And and it's, second, yeah, yeah cool. it's just crazy. And they and they said we're about the collective. So that's what they were saying. They're saying it's not about any one individual. Like that's how they tried to put it. So I'm like, oh my god, you're really trying to trying to double talk so me like I this. I wonder. I guarantee you, the 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 director or the the CEO of the mm -hmm. organization. Yep. is doing really well. I yeah, I'll, guarantee yeah I, I actually do have some, <laughs> I'm doing some digging now. So yeah, I, I'll address that in future. I actually do have some figures. Um, that's, that's what yeah, I'm talking it, about. Yeah, How it's fair? ridiculous. Yeah, and, and I mean, the way they do it too. And the funny thing is, is a lot of stuff's off the books too, because guess what? A meat director is an independent contractor. So the meat director can keep all of the money from, I think every nationals from like 2018 and before was kept by the meat director, the profit. And if you have a you know, if you have a thousand lifters pay a hundred fifty dollars submission fee, you're dealing with at least a hundred fifty thousand collective revenue, if not up to three hundred thousand, probably somewhere in that range. And then nobody knows what level of profit that is. So you might profit tens of thousands from one one meet. It's possible. I would say it's probably pretty likely. And then no one knows <laughs> where that goes. Oh, absolutely. So say I mean say that like you just said, if there's a hundred if there's a hundred lifters that. Mm -hmm. Hundred bucks a piece, and then yeah. you're doing multiple meets per year. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, crazy. The, 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 not all, you're you're charged, and plus, also too is they like I said, they charge for more than just they're charging yeah, sure um, uh, the, the 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 fee that you're talking about, like the mm -hmm. membership fee. Mm -hmm. They're charging. They're they're sanctioning people. They're charging they people 
for um, they're charging people for if they violate some kind of rule, you get charged. Yeah. All these different things. They even have a coaching fee now in the USAPL coaching fee. You have to pay money and to even have be to have a coach <laughs> from. I guarantee you, a membership coach yeah. from that federation. Yep, yep, and yeah, and that's guarantee, crazy. And I will guarantee <laughs> you that coach has probably never competed in a competition ever in his life. <laughs> yeah, it really is crazy. And, and by the way, that was the nationals literally was 1000 lifters too. Like that's also, that was not an exaggeration. It was like 1,048 lifters. So it's like, <laughs> you're dealing with that level and then you're adding fees. So how much where, money is it? How much yeah, money is it? Oh, it's, it, that's what I'm saying. It's at least, I mean, I would say it's at least 200,000 revenue for one competition. If not more, I mean, it really is. It, it's, it's crazy. One thing I want to ask you is well first of all i want to commend you for being such a strong lifter who has that entrepreneurial mindset because i i'm the type of guy where i'm you know i i have over 500 wilks i'd say i'm a very solid lifter i'd say i'm a very good lifter objectively like probably in the top one percent as far as just total lifters but you know i'm no ray williams i'm not the guy who really could say like look i have this lift and the one thing i have seen is those lifters very rarely are care about this very rarely are knowledgeable about how to negotiate about how to push the sport forward a lot of them don't even care about where the sport goes to be honest they kind of just play their part so why do you have that mindset that maybe others don't because i've learned from being burned Mm -hmm. i've been burned so many times and uh, i'm just a money guy when i see money and, and and the fact that i'm paying to compete yeah and you're getting publicity and I get a eight dollar trophy. <laughs> and so what somebody hit me with was, he said, "So what happens if you get injured at this meet or at a meet? Do they pay mm-hmm. you any kind of compensation? Do they provide any insurance or anything like that?" And I said, "You know what? I don't think I need to check into that." And then I got mm-hmm. to I got to thinking about it, and doing some research, and just looking at it overall from experience. And even some of the bigger events that were held, no one very rarely do people do payouts. So like uh, Showdown, the Kern, there's a few. There's a few that that will do payouts. Yeah. But still, when it comes to feats of strength that nobody has ever done, um, the money that they're offering is just a drop in the bucket. Yeah. You know, the bring home is you know well over hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, mm-hmm. and the fact that you can't give one lifter ten twenty. $30,000 for a record that has been shattered, that is something that nobody has ever done. Um, it just blows my mind. Yeah. And this is my life. Uh, you know, like very few get to monetize and and uh, do this for a living um, as far as the sport of powerlifting. Um, so it's just like, it is what it is. Like, I have to make sure that, I was talking about this today, it'll be on my next YouTube video. I have to set myself up for the next 10 years of my life, 20 years of my life. Yeah. So the impact that I'm leaving is just far more greater than what's in the moment. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's bigger than that. So therefore you are going to pay me. Like I had a guy call me a couple weeks ago and he said, um, Hey, I want to have you out here for a meet. Come hit a PR, maybe 790, maybe mm-hmm. even 800. I'll give you 600 bucks. You pay for your plane ticket. Now I'll, I'll get your hotel room. Yeah, it's nothing. And I'm thinking, I'm like, bro, the ticket alone <laughs> is going to be like five, six hundred dollars. Yeah, dollars. So you're telling me you'll give me five hundred dollars to come and, and, and so what he hit me with was, um, and we'll get you more uh, notoriety. Like we'll get uh-huh. more people to follow you. And I'm thinking, like, when I started this, I was by myself. Mm-hmm. Like right now, yeah, I have a production company now, but. Up for the past, I mean, up until you know last year, I was doing all this on my own, my editing videos. Um, or, and, and at the end of the day, like, no, you're gonna if you're making thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, mm-hmm. guess what? I'm gonna make hundreds of thousands. <laughs> of dollars. So, yeah, that's what it, I like. is what it is. So, what I want to ask you is with um, well, two part question is first of all. Uh, when it came to getting on ESPN, what was your role in that? And then secondly, with this event with the Cubs, is is this going to be just you or is it going to be a, a full bench meet kind of like last time where there are other lifters? It's going to be just me. Just you? Wow. That's, so so you negotiated that deal straight with it? How, how does that even work? Because people from the outside looking in, they always wonder like what's going to take the sport to the next level. 
and you're really just taking it into your own hands. So actually, that's what we're working on. So this is kind of the blueprint mm-hmm. uh, to this. But we want we want to. So like, I want to host one of the eventually. One, I want to host one of the biggest powerlifting meets uh, ever in the history of of the world, and wow. I want to pay the athlete. Uh, if if we bring in X amount of money, the athlete will get a percentage of that, a yeah. uh, huge percentage of it. The athletes that that um, that are winning, and the athletes that are, um, I would say, the stand up parts that are, uh, for example, like me. Yeah. If I come, or uh, or the next uh, eleven hundred and fifty pound squad, or, or how, however we put it, you know. Um, yeah. Just that anomaly that comes once in a lifetime or, or once every 10 years, they need to be rewarded. But I think every lifter that wins needs to be rewarded. I do. Yeah. I really I believe that. You know, if, so if you win, whether Wilkes or if you win just by overall, whatever the case may be, you need to go home with a check. At least mm-hmm. enough money to cover, heck, rent, uh, your flight, <laughs> uh, put some extra ducats in your, buy, in your pocket, uh, maybe buy a few other things that you needed. Um, mm-hmm. something that, that where you leave and you're like, man, um, you know, not just the accomplishment of winning, but you're like, man, it was worth it. Yeah. And the money is even better incentive. I'm not saying fifty, seventy thousand dollars, but even five thousand dollars per athlete. Yeah. Even twenty five hundred per athlete. I'm yeah, the saying. moment people just see the scale, I think I think the moment you lay the groundwork, it's very similar. This is why I always say about powerlifting is like I wish there were more levels to it so people could get inspired because it's like like we talked about um you know like you threw shot put in uh in high school we talked about actually i think it might have been our first try so off camera we talked about how you threw shot put and it's like you can say i went to state so i went to this level i wish there were more levels and then as you have more levels you have gradients of money to where maybe because maybe not everybody is going to bench you know 800 maybe someone's just going to work on benching you know 500 at like 220 or something like that and then if you see a little bit of money come in especially if you reward people for bringing viewers into this um which for example the usapl like there are multiple people with 100,000 followers doing a usapl nationals and then a prime time uh, prime time one with Russ, myself, Sean Noriega, like our prime time, I think was the most viewed and it like on a live stream, it got like 77,000 views. And it's like, that is something that's tangible that that has worth. And I do yeah. think exactly cool. what you're saying, where it's like, if you distribute it to where at least people have some incentive to grow the sport and then everybody eats basically like everybody gets something, I think then it would make the camaraderie so much stronger. Absolutely. Uh, will you get my water out of the car? I guess go ahead and order some pizza. I'm sorry, my wife's there you in go. my neck. Um, no. But uh, but yeah, wait, wait. One question that I have with you with the with the Cubs situation. So is that going to be is that going to be intertwined with other events? Like, are they going to be playing a, a game like a baseball game soon after or whatever? Or are they it'll doing be, it just? It'll be after the game. So after the game. Uh, yeah, they'll let that go on. They're going to advertise it through the game. Okay, and, that's awesome. That's uh, awesome. Oh, yeah, it'll be commercial. I mean, I guess it's real deal. There's <laughs> yeah. multiple commercials going on. Um, that's one of the selling points. Uh, but it, it's going to be a big deal. So the next several weeks, we're just working on getting uh, some sponsors that are not your typical sponsors that would typically sponsor a uh, powerlifting event. Yeah. So that's so, another thing that's so- different. So is that going to be at all? Is that through a federation at all, or is that just straight up bypassing yeah, we, traditional I, federations? I've been lacking on that. I need to reach out to a couple people because, like most federations, they kind of get iffy when it comes to um, when it comes to only being one lifter. Mm-hmm. But um, we're gonna find a federation that allows it and allows me to uh, lift, which I already have a couple in mind that I, I've already put it in my like, area, and they're yeah. gonna work with back in so that's 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 the only deal so is is getting because the one with espn in order for that federation to be able to host it they had to um at least there had to be five lifters in the event yeah and that was through the uspa right yeah 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 that's ownership yeah what'd you say they didn't take any ownership about the misload or anything. They was just like, well, <laughs> really? it is what it is. 
Yeah, that's see, that's the tough part. Like that's that's exactly from from someone like myself's perspective is like the tough part is I think the USAPL and IPF do screw over the lifters financially the most because they have the most amount of money that's never explained. Um, yeah. And even when you bring up revenue, for example, like I'm really looking into this very deeply. Like I know for a fact that the USAPL generates around uh, two million in revenue per year, and then even in assets, which is just money left over, essentially profit in a nonprofit. Like that's <laughs> that's how convoluted this stuff is. It's like 800,000 that's carried over to where it's just wow. they have extra. <laughs> yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Like, what are you doing? I mean, think about that. Like, yeah. what are you doing with that amount of money? Like, what is that allotted mm. for? Yeah. Just I, saving it? Yeah, I, I, it's real. Yeah, like the thing that's so stupid is now what they're doing is they're taking the IPF to court about Arnold world records that like happened eight months ago. So they're suing like the IPF under to where you're just like, dude, no one cares about that stuff. Like just make people money. <laughs> just take all like, that money and give it to the IPF for what now? At the Arnold, they basically there were confusing rules whether the Arnold counts as a world record. So you can set a world record in the USAPL, but if it's not an IPF meet, which is another step, then it doesn't count as an IPF world record. So the USAPL is saying the Arnold records should count as world records, and the IPF is saying they don't, and they're suing over that. <laughs> You're just like, how can you even sue over that? Like, yeah, it's very you, weird. That <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, just green, though. Like, yeah, it, it's really, and even then, it's like even with like blurry things like that. I've looked into the figures of like, okay, how much do they spend on lawyers a year? It's never been, uh, you know, half a million. So it's like, they definitely have a lot left over that. I just don't know. I don't know what they're planning on. I mean, maybe they're just, I don't even want to assume I, cause that's one thing I do actually have to be careful on is legally I can't assume motives. <laughs> All I could say is yeah. they certainly are not paying the lifters, <laughs> but, um, well, well yeah. I've heard, I mean, I'm just saying what I've heard and I'm not saying it's mm -hmm. fact. But I've heard certain people who have, uh, who are more um, no well known, mm -hmm. uh, they'll get some kickback under the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one legally where, yeah, we can't go too far. I'm just, that's I'm crazy. just yeah. that's what I've heard. I'm not saying yeah. that's factual. I'm not. Yeah. Putting that on them. That's well, there, what yeah. I've heard before. It's just basically yeah, in in the one, I mean, well, here's the one thing where you know things are a little weird is when the meet directors ends up being a rotating list of who gets the big meets. And then it's the same, it'll be like some some of the same four people who get to do these meets, these big meets. And then the meet director, like I said, is an independent contractor. So it's like, it's such See, a I perfect would, I setup. I would do an IPF meet. I really would. Yeah. I would I would compete in IPF, uh, you know, um, but all the other federations, yeah. the WRPF is probably one of the best federations. Well, federations, you know what, so. you know, even with testosterone, the one thing you'd technically have to do is you'd need a three year grace per period uh, because even, even um, TRT is uh, banned in the IPF. But if you had a three year grace period, so I think you should do that. Then take three years of no external test and then boom, then you can do it. I, I could, if I wanted to, I could easily go do a 700 pound lift in three years. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm just, yeah. but I thought, listen, IPF drug tested, but I thought IPF has a non drug tested uh, uh, sanction, sanctioning body, like where you could, they have events for non tested. Oh, no, no, the IPF, no, the IPF's like extremely against drug use. Like they're, they're to a point where they make it like it's their, well, actually, here's what's a funny thing is like that's one of the reasons they're a non profit is they claim like their purpose is drug free sport. So that's why the USPA is a for profit organization, whereas the USAPL and IPF. Was it? That's what I don't understand, though. Like, I was on the verge of like mentally, men, like a mental, uh, mentally destruction, mental, mentally destructing myself, mm -hmm. like just, in, just in general, of just a total meltdown, right? Yeah. So, testosterone basically saved my life, saved my marriage. So when you look at it in that aspect, it's like if someone has a vitamin C deficiency, what do you give them? Yeah. Yeah, vitamin C, exactly. vitamin D, any any of those deficiencies, um, if you don't fix it, then it could create more problems. Yeah. Just like low testosterone. If I didn't fix it, it was going to create more problems. Yeah. So you're telling me I can't compete in this federation yeah. that I, I've been tested and I've been diagnosed basically by a doctor saying that I need this supplement. So you're telling me that you would let other people that have deficiencies that take 
other medicines. But for some reason, well, so actually, you know, here's one thing I will say, and this this will be to their credit, is they are so extreme on this. You can literally have cancer and need something that's external, and they will not allow you to compete. So they they actually are that crazy to where they make that's it on BS. principle. <laughs> that's BS. You're not, you <laughs> yeah. know what that tells me? Yeah. Is you're not for the lifter. Yeah, I do agree with that's that. That's what that tells me. You're not for the lifter. I don't care what federation, what whoever wants to bring the smoke. I'm just saying you're not for the lifter if that's the case. Yeah. Well, I, actually, I yeah. testosterone because of the benefits. Yeah. But when it comes to someone that's wanting to compete that has some kind of uh, illness like that, and you mm-hmm. tell them that they can't have their treatments and compete at the same time, no, that tells me you're not for the the lifter. You're yeah. not about the sport. You're about the money and the power in politics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, re- it's really like it's because it actually connects to they're being sued about uh, transgender inclusion. Now, where that there are certainly points where, you know, I completely agree with as far as male to female transitions, in my opinion, should not be able to compete um, in the female division. Um, I don't think so. either. Now, that yeah. right there, I would have to. Yeah, that's, different. <laughs> yeah. that's totally different. I seen a guy. I seen a a, a, a guy. Yeah, speak carefully here <laughs> or else, or yeah, else people be mad. I, know it. I, know I seen a guy. Um, or a transgender and played mm-hmm. uh, for some college. And I mean, he totally destroyed the other team basically by itself. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. and, and I'm just saying it's just, it, uh, that's something I would say that's not fair. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's like, that's the part where I agree with the USAPL, but then what they'll do, and this is, this is connects to their principles here is what they'll do is if you transition from female to male, they won't allow you to compete with the men. And to me, it's like that's one of those points where it's like, if anything, you're going to have a genetic disadvantage, obviously. And then that makes just no sense. But because they are that strict on exogenous hormones being banned categorically, they are. I I, I guess the one thing we can give them credit is they are consistent. So (laughs) to to point. But like you said, I don't just just let everybody know we're not talking about any specific organization. We're just saying in general, right? <laughs> well, I'm fine. No, I'm, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm getting so serious here with the USAPL where as long as, as long as my statements are technically correct, I'm just going in. Like it, it's to that yeah. point because, you know, the way they really are kind of like rude back to you if you do like question their authority. So I'm like, all right, there's something there. But uh, yeah, I, I won't make this, you know, a bash fest on them, especially since the point is to highlight yourself. But uh, yeah, so... Okay. Yeah, so I just want to say is um, that ESPN moment is really awesome because you you really are the one power lifter because Thor obviously is a strong man, you know he's he's taken himself to ESPN, but the fact that you're pushing also with um with the Cub situation is that going to be live streamed? Uh, that'll be I don't know if it's gonna be live streamed because they want to keep the rights where they can sell the rights to other um uh, other platforms like yeah. Fox uh, Sports and things like that so. Um, yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. It's a big deal. Starting to, starting to really, um, I'm really starting to see that and, and like feel it and like, um, just yeah. because, you know, a lot of times it just doesn't seem real. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? especially with, yeah. And that, and that's one of the cool parts is, um, especially when you ascend as quickly as you have, it's like, then the ball really is in, in your hands as far as where you want to take this. So one question I have for you is let's say you bench 800 pounds. What what would you do after that? Are you the type where you bench eight hundred pounds? You'd be like, all right, that was my goal. And if no one's near me, would you move on to different goal? Or would you push it? Yeah, uh, I think the number is eight hundred five. Mm-hmm. And once I get eight hundred five, I'm going to the strong man. Really? That's yeah. fascinating. So I'm gonna try it out just to see how I fit. Um, I've always been a very athletic uh, guy, and I want to, you know, uh, you know, it, it's it's crazy because. A lot of times people, they give up when it comes to after they achieve their goal. And they're like, ah, they get complacent, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to get complacent. I want to continue to outwork myself, continue to outgrow myself, and show myself that, you know, there was a point in time where um, I just couldn't see myself doing anything positive or making any kind of waves on any platform. And now that I see that, it's like, you know, it's my turn, and I'm going to continue to carry this out until, you know, until the Lord takes me, so. Yeah, that's awesome. So if you did that, if let's say you go from you bench eight oh five, then you go to strongman, 
would you still uh, be involved in powerlifting, especially on the entrepreneurial side? Because that's the thing I'm thinking is like, we need you. We need someone oh, like yeah, you. Yeah. Who's, I think so. Uh, uh, I think I'll be hosting meets and things like that. Yeah. Uh, That'd be awesome. Be, uh, I'll probably start coaching and doing seminars and things along those lines. Just being basically an, an ambassador for the sport. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but for the most part, you know, it's uh, I've never really got a chance to sit down and, and take it all in because I was always waiting for the next lift. Yeah. Waiting to get strong, waiting for the next peak, waiting to for the next uh, PR. So this time will give me opportunities to kind of sit still, soak it up, and enjoy the moment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, so yeah. one yeah. W- and now speaking of strongman, one question that I'm sure a lot of people have actually when I asked on Instagram for questions, one thing that constantly came up is people are wondering, do you squat and deadlift? Just Absolutely. in tra- you do. Yeah. Well, not now, not at this moment, because you know, again. Squatting, deadlifting creates a lot of other problems, issues. Mm-hmm. But we're so close to the world record to this 800 pound bench press. Yeah. There's no point in, in doing those things when you got other uh, variations that are just as effective and um, you know do the job. Yeah. So I saw you were hack squatting, right? At one point, yeah. I, I saw a video like that. So you train full body, but you just use other lifts to get the job done. I imagine Perfect. you do hamstring curls, things like that. Absolutely. People think that I just go in, bench, leave, and eat. You know, like. I'm not. I don't mean this to sound arrogant, but 99% of powerlifters out there, I will work circles around them. <laughs> I kid, like my my capacity to be able to work out and endure yeah. through workouts and do multiple um, multiple variations, uh, handling heavy uh, heavier loads is is um, I haven't really. The only person I've seen that that matches my energy is the only people that I've seen that matches my energy. Is is my buddy Tyler O'Bringer and Thomas Davis, mm-hmm. um, but I have not seen anyone else match the energy that I bring whenever it comes to working out. I'm, yeah. I kid you not, and I've worked out with the best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like I believe it because you can feel the passion straightforward. It's like you you never say you're for a goal and then kind of like kind of halfway commit to it. It's like you're all the way. Um, oh, and yeah. actually, actually, I I asking about this is let's let me give you a hypothetical. Is what if since you have such a strong bench um, and you're considering strongman, is would you consider any in-between time of going for the all-time total world record as you transition into that? I'm a realist also, and I think, you know, the time, for example, if I'm going to break something like that, I would have to stay above 400 pounds easy. Mm -hmm. I would have to stay above 420 if I'm going to do some type of uh, I have such an impact on uh, 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 full power. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is I'm not willing to wait that long a time to do a full power. Now, if things happen to happen while I'm in transition to do strongman and squatting and deadlifting are just clicking on all cylinders along with bench press and the strongman training, then I might give it a shot. But, um, you know, on top of running my, my business and everything else, and trying, I mean, because you think about it, what other, what other athlete out there is 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 running their business and competing at the same time? Very mm-hmm. few, mm-hmm. very few. Um, I think Dan Green, Stephanie Cohen. Um, there's not, there's not many that yeah. are like actually at some point in their prime and handling business. Corell, but I think that was later on after, after before the WRPF. So, um, with that being said, I've learned that stressors outside of the gym will impact your um will impact your progress in the gym so yeah. i don't want to add on all this extra uh stuff while i got you know on top of me trying to um you know build a brand and uh starting something new like strong man it's just i don't know i'm just i'm just yeah. being honest i don't know if it happens it happens yeah so what uh speaking of body weight your body weight for ideal benching is around like 445, right? Is that yep. correct? So that yeah. So right now, what is the what is the plan for this year and then long term? For the after this 800 pound 805, I'm going mm-hmm. for uh, I want to lose about 40 pounds, get right around 400, wow. and then uh, long term is to cut down to about 300 pounds. Wow. So would you would you consider uh would you do like bodybuilding style training at 300 because you would be <laughs> you'd be a brick house 
I'm already doing it. I'm trying to be 300, 325 and jacked. <laughs> um, I, I mean, here's the thing. I've never seen myself doing anything like this. Mm-hmm. And now that I got the opportunity to do and be whoever I want to be, by God, I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so go from strongman to bodybuilding to golfing to uh, walking <laughs> on uh, the line for the uh, Tennessee Titans. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to do it. That's like, awesome. uh, life's too short. And yeah. I remember laying in a jail cell with no hope, no vision. And uh, now that I have hope, I have a vision. I have, mm-hmm. um, I have a drive that I've never had before. Like I'm, I'm, I'm venturing out all, all things. I'm, I'm, I'm doing whatever I want to do. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So um, before we, I do want to backtrack before we get into, I have a few more like big picture questions. But as far as uh, program is is concerned, one thing I'd never asked you is, what are your top three accessories right now for the bench press? Let's say not counting push-ups. So let's say something like barbell accessories or isolations. What would you say barbell are your top three? Let's just yeah. go to uh, one thing. One of my favorite staples is single arm tricep extension. Really? I um, really love those. Uh, is that is that uh, underhand grip or pronated regular grip or underhand grip? Uh, supernated pronated pronated grip. Um, okay. Pronated grip. So I usually do the handle and just do like a push down. Just push down. Okay. Uh, super heavy. Um, man, I've really become uh, acquainted with uh, bands. Really? I've never really. I, I would do bands very. I mean, it's kind of flaky, but over the past you know eight weeks since I've been training with. Uh, Matt Winning and um, a few others. We've really been utilizing bands. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but um, so we said, do you mean you mean uh, bands just straight up, not bands as in in addition to like a, a bench or anything like that? You're not talking yeah. about accommodation resistance. You're just talking straight bands, right? No addition. Uh, oh, addition. Two, okay. So okay. Uh, weights and bands. I'm um, usually on the back down set. So well, okay. typically, I do bands after. Um, so I got I got my top set, I got my back down set, mm-hmm. and then I got bands. Interesting. So my my uh, my my bench days. You better you better pack two lunch boxes. It's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna be a long day. <laughs> and my body has just you know I've just um, for so long, I'm just at a point to where my body is basically adapted to yeah. um, being able to place uh, being able to do all this volume in one training session. Uh, So we got, um, there's so many accessories, floor presses Mm -hmm. with dumbbells or with a barbell. Um, Let's do pin presses. Yeah. But one of my favorites that that a finisher, uh, it's, it's, it's a ladder, but it's done with uh, like a, like almost like elevated push up. So, you know, the Smith machine, right? Yeah. We start at the we start at the very bottom of the Smith machine, and the whole target is to get to 200 without um, without stopping. So 200 straight reps. Wow! But as you start to see a breakdown of form, you move up levels. So as the form is breaking down, you move up levels to make the the lift a little easier. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking about a tricep uh, uh, tricep killer, that is probably one of the best. <laughs> Bicep killers I've ever done, just because you're still able to place the load, and I, be, I believe that um, you're still able to place the load even though you're already tapped out. So you're still yeah. able to not necessarily place the load, but still able to um, I don't know the word the right word I'm looking for, but you're still able to complete the lift due to the 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 lift getting easier as you go up the ladder. Yeah. So you want to try to complete that within 200. Uh, try to complete the 200 reps um, in as few as sets possible. Wow, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm telling you, bro, it is a uh, it's it's different. It's real different. Yeah. So you so yeah. now you don't do any or do you do no incline now? Because you mentioned how you you're gradually phasing out incline, right? Yeah, we we ha- we just haven't. You know, I do incline every now and then, but I just feel like it doesn't carry over as much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you keep it all mostly flat, right? And and do you do actually do you do a close grip bench at all? Mm-hmm. Okay. We do close grip sometimes. Close grip can be um, per, uh, so we go by like anywhere from uh, six to twelve week cycles, mm-hmm. meaning the, some of the workouts might change. 
every mm-hmm. six to twelve weeks. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, um, it, it all depends on the block. So, what would you um, say? Well, what would you say is your go-to, especially on like a meat cycle? Where you're like, oh, I know every time I have this in, like this is a good one. Would you say like floor press is above close grip? Like, what would you say is that one barbell one that's like the one? Bands. Just the band, uh, banded bench, yeah. Yeah, bands, bands. Uh, that's just uh, that's. I'm seeing how beneficial that is, but something that I do a little different is um, I will make sure that uh, the stretch re- the stretch reflex is out. So mm-hmm. at the at the bottom, I'm completely paused until the bar is completely motionless, and then I'm going to explode through the yeah. through the band. So I think that has helped with me being explosive, but that's my go-to. I, I am, I am a I, like when it comes to um, uh, I guess a variation um, that I would see the most carryover. Obviously, is um, bands. bands. So what what type of uh, sets and reps do you usually do on the bands after? Because you say you do like uh, a, a competition with a single and then volume work, or do you just so do you do a single volume work? Co- yeah. Well, it depends where we're at in the programming. But like today, I did two sets of 545, mm-hmm. uh, two sets of eight. Then back down to 505 for some reps. And then back down to 405 uh, for with bands. Wow. So, four so when, you, when, you do the, when you do that middle volume work, is that two sets? Or are you talking two sets or like four sets? Uh, no, usually that's, that's about – Three, three sets, three, three set, sets, okay. three reps. You know, so it just depends where we're at in the program. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's low intensity because I haven't lifted in three weeks. Yeah, I mean that's still a lot of yeah, that's a lot of work because especially. So you're so, saying you're oh, doing? Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, you're doing basically first. five competition bench working sets more or less, uh, and then you're doing the banded bench. So how many sets did you say of the banded bench? Uh, the banded bench, like today, I did two sets, two, two sets, sets of three. And they're paws, like long. Of three, pulse. okay. Yes. Okay, that's so interesting. So, you, so more speed. Yeah, more speed. So okay. that's what we're basically focusing on: lower the weight, um, definitely lower the weight, and just focus on exploding off the chest and locking out, mm-hmm. driving through the lockout, uh, driving through the lockout point. So um, that's probably been the best, or or however you want to put it, the the biggest asset to the arsenal of. Uh, accessories that I have. Yeah. And uh, I have two just very specific questions is first of all, I've noticed that it seems like everybody who's strong never does wide grip bench. So do you not do wide grip bench at all as an accessory? <laughs> no. Well, I mean, like yeah. I just don't feel like it benefits. Yeah. So the point of people doing wide grip is to shorten the, the travel, uh, the, yeah. the bar pack. Right. So we want to shorten that. Well, what about as a chest accessory? It's like you really don't see a lot of people just do wide grip. Yeah. It's just one of those ones where. I mean, again, we're talking about mileage and the whole yeah. point of training hard is to reduce mileage. And the wider the wider your hand placement is, considering where the load is going to be, mm-hmm. that creates a lot of problems in the shoulder area. That's mm-hmm. why you see a lot of people that bench wide or that have their elbows flared out to where it's wider. Yeah. Um, creates problems in this in this yeah. shoulder so um we just looked and seen what's been beneficial and what hasn't like mm-hmm. what's caused the most friction or caused the most trouble in programming and what has it yeah. and carry it over what carries over the the most yeah yeah and that's all people want to make people want to make programming like it's so complicated and so uh like it's just this this matrix of things <laughs> Which it can get complicated, but I think for the most part, if we just focus on finding the weaknesses and fixing the weaknesses, that's yeah. it. Yeah. You find out where your weakness is, and then you exploit the weakness, and that keeps on happening. Yeah. And you get stronger and stronger and stronger, and st- and it just keeps it just keeps going, you know, until you quit or you get hurt or you're satisfied. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. So the the final one I want to ask you is: Do you are you a believer in doing touch and go separately as an accessory, or do you just not do touch and go whatsoever? Do you pause everything, practice how you compete type of guy? Maybe the first few, maybe the first few sets. If it's like uh, one thirty-five, two twenty-five. Okay, but yeah, every working set, you're all every, every working set should be a pause. Uh, if you like, <sighs> there are a lot of strong guys who don't do that, and it does seem like they get punished for it on meet day. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's guys that, <laughs> that these gym bro lifters that, that come in and they're doing touch and goes. And then mm -hmm. when it's time to do a pause press, they can't catch it out. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's just like, uh, let's, uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, I mean, look at it this way. Do you think, I don't know if I'll keep going to Jordan, but do you think Michael Jordan practiced in flip flops? Absolutely <laughs> not. He's got his placed up, ready to go. Yeah. He, hands taped up, knees taped up. Um, just like a real basketball game. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we just we look at it in that in that aspect and and, and say, look, and this needs to be as close to uh, meet day as possible. Yeah. So that's kind of yeah. where where I'm. Actually, now now think of accessories. I have, I have two more questions for you because you know it's not often that you get the strongest bencher ever. Oh, that's all good. To, to, yeah, to ask if if you do it. One is, do you ever do feet up bench Larson press? No. Now, have you tried it and didn't like it, or did you just not see the reasoning? I, I used to try it before, but what benefit mm -hmm. is it? Well, I mean, what's it benefiting? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 from what I well, from what I've seen, I think who it benefits the most are probably bigger archers generally, where they really arch and they just decreases the arch. But if you don't have a really big arch, it does kind of just add instability, which you know that at That's that point I don't see that as good. Yeah. So we're looking for optimal, right? Mm -hmm. And. I just can't like I, for me. I can't. Uh, th that's just something that it's going to create more instability. I don't. I just. I've just yeah. never seen yeah. the benefit from yeah, it. And, okay, if that was the case, if that was the case, I would just do floor presses. Yeah, I can see that. You yeah. get what I'm saying? So, though I don't do Larson presses, is what that's what they call them. Mm -hmm. Um, I do floor presses. Yeah. That way, they're like it's typically whenever you got your feet up in the air. I'm just saying, like to me, that just seems dangerous. Because mm -hmm. when it comes to heavier weight, all it takes is one wrong move. Yeah, that, that if you're makes not sense. stable with that weight, and your core is not as strong as it needs to be, or if if something's lagging, um, I mean, it can be devastating. But I forgot to tell you about bench. You know what? You know what's more important? I mean, just as important. Mm -hmm. Um, as any of these accessories I've, I mentioned, what's that? It's back work. Back work. Back. Interesting. Yep. I train back. I hit some type of back variation every single day. I train. Every really? time. Every time I'm in the gym, I do some type of back variation at a different angle. Um, so some people say to every push movement you need to do two pulling movements, mm -hmm. but to every push movement I do four pulling movements. Really? Uh, I mean, think about oh. it. Uh, uh, your back controls stability. Mm -hmm. The more fluent you are in your lift, the stronger the lift is going to be. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a piston in a car. If a piston is is measured out of the perfect diameter and going, I don't know, maybe this is a poor analogy, but going in and out of, um, I guess, the, the engine block, that's how a piston goes, yeah. right? Yeah. In and out. If one part of that piston is, is out of whack, it causes more friction, right? It doesn't yeah. run as fluent as it should. So that's kind of the same way I look at it when it comes to bench press. If um, if your back isn't stable and you don't have the proper stability to be able to hold that amount of weight, and as it's coming down, you ever seen lifters where they're kind of juggling the weight as they're coming yeah. down? Yeah, yeah. Fifty. Nine times out of ten, the, when those lifters press that weight, they don't they don't get it because they're not stable. They're not yeah. um, everything. Put it this way. When it comes to bench press, everything is about maintaining tightness. And if your back isn't tight, you're not stable, you're shifting, then a lot of times you're as strong as your weakest link, and that's where you're going to fail at. I've noticed once I've increased, over the past two years, once I've increased back volume and um, increased back volume, become more stable, my numbers have shot up. I mean, really? they, they've just, I'm more confident in my lift. Yeah. Um, I was able to think about it. If anybody else had 800 pounds on the bar that's misloaded, and, and <laughs> more, think about it though. Yeah. Like it would have turned out a lot, a lot worse. But yeah. I'm in it for just a more fluent movement. Basically, mm -hmm. is what is the reason why you got like your back is a launching pad. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you've heard all these all these uh, cliche sayings like big back, big bench, and all that stuff. Is I mean, it's true. Mm -hmm. The bigger your back, the more you're able to support the weight that you're going to lift. And especially at your size, 
and at your muscular development, I mean, you get to a point where the literal range of motion is probably also changed favorably from having such a big back to where it's like you're literally also elevating where your body is on the bench. Absolutely. I've, I've noticed that one one side of my back is bigger than the other. One muscle mm -hmm. uh, is bigger than the other, my upper trap. So whenever I'm tight mm -hmm. and my upper trap is on the bench, I have to make sure I'm digging into the bench to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm even – I can get as even as possible because it kind of sets me. And when you're talking up 700 plus, everything yeah. I can tell if the yeah. floor is uneven. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that—that's how big of a deal it is. I can literally tell you if your floor is uneven due to the weight it's swaying, depending on mm -hmm. you know how the floor is set. So, um, yeah, man, back is very vital for bench press. Dang, that's awesome. Have you ever done? Actually, this is going to be one of one of the goals um, for myself. I've just set this for fun. Is a weighted pull up one rep max? Have you ever done really heavy weighted pull ups? Never done weighted pull ups, heavy weighted pull ups, but I've done pull ups at four hundred plus. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. That is, a, yeah, that's a thing. It's like especially bigger guys. It's like just being able to do the eight to ten clean reps. That's kind of similar to Ray Williams, where he I've also has a very big reps. That's it. The most you've I've done what? Ever done with the most three. I've ever done was three like clean yeah. reps. The rest were sloppy, but I've done yeah. five, I think four to five in a row. Mm -hmm. So for your back work, do you mostly do really heavy rows um, in machine work? Is that it? Machine work, rows, um, bands, um, any kind of movement that's a pulling. I mean, that, that you're going mm -hmm. to be uh, pulling. So and just a ton of volume. Ton of volume. I mean, when it comes to back, my volume doubles. So we're talking yeah. anywhere from six sets, uh, six I'd sets, say yeah. 12 to 20 reps. And RPE is probably going to be between eight and nine. Like wow. We want to make sure that we are killing the back. I mean, try it out for yourself and then yeah. get back with me. In six yeah. weeks. And it you've never, you've never had any back injury, right? Because that's the thing is like the lats really can tolerate a ton without, you don't really hear of someone having a lat tear from doing too many rows. Like you don't often <laughs> really hear about yeah. that. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you, you're, and think about it. The way your back responds mm -hmm. is a lot differently than a lot of your other muscles. You can train yeah. back really hard today, and maybe maybe in 24 hours, you're able to train, again, train yeah. your back again. So I don't know if that – I'm not a doctor. I'm just saying my thought is maybe since it's so close to your central nervous system, I mean, mm -hmm. since your, your spine, that um, – your back recovers a lot faster. I don't know if, if that's right or not, but it just it makes sense to me. Yeah, no matter but, what, uh, it just seems apparent that it's like, actually one thing that I was curious about, even with yourself too, is like the fact that you don't really suffer serious injuries, right? And that, that I think that kind of makes you unique at this stage in the game. Oh, I, absolutely. I haven't had any really crazy injuries and I, besides a box jump. I did a box jump a few mm -hmm. years ago um, and that didn't turn out well, but... Other what happened that, from that? What what was the worst injury you've had then? Well, I jumped on. A, I tried to attempt to jump on a box on a uh, like a thirty six inch box, twenty eight inch box, on a thirty inch mm -hmm. box, and I jumped on top of it, but it was a soft box, so the box mm -hmm. flexed, kicked out from underneath me, fell straight on my back, was out for about six months. Wow. The doctor told me I would never. Um, he said you'd never lift heavy weights again. And I walked out of that room and was like, yeah, his mom. What um, happened? Did you have like herniated discs? What, what was no, it? Uh, so this shoulder right here, there's a big, huge knot where this AC yeah. joint is elevated. This wow. AC joint is sticking out. Your AC joint is not supposed to stick out. Mm -hmm. So when I would bench, it would click. It would click really bad, and it almost felt like that this shoulder wasn't in the socket. Wow. So what I did was I just continued to push through it and, and got a lot of uh, deep tissue work. And continue to get, uh, you know, continue to work out, and it just worked itself. The body wow. does amazing things, man. Yeah, that's a great message for people to see. Yeah, and you pushed it more than anybody. I mean, whatever, because a lot of people, I think, can imagine that the best bench presser on the planet is going to have this like perfect mix of genetics and environment where everything goes together, and he's able to hit it at this one moment. But I think that that shows that I mean, even with a freak accent like that, the durability itself is more important than the perfect scenario. Oh yeah, absolutely. So that's where I get the, I I, I go by this this the slogan of uh, stay in your own lane, mm -hmm. stay in my lane because um, a lot of people try to get you to do do all this gym bro stuff so yeah. you can 
uh, basically a pissing contest to see who can do the best, to see who can do this. And I'm just not, I'm just not, I'm not in it. I'm, I'm staying yeah. in my own lane, my programming, and I'm gonna prove it on the platform. You know, yeah. like that's what that's another thing is like everybody's everybody's tagging me in this guy. Like I, I talked earlier, yeah, the guy Daniel from Iran, and yeah, he posted a 716 pound bench. But you know what it takes to get from 720 to 770 or 780 <laughs> yeah. can be a lifetime. Even yeah. to a 730 can be a lifetime. Yeah. So the fact that people don't put respect on what I've worked for, I mean, it does. I'm not mad at the lifter, but I'm pissed off. I get pissed off at the people that yeah. think that it's just that easy. Yeah. You know, that's so, actually one uh, thing I want to ask you too, is mentally, since you came up at a time when the bench record was basically low sevens, um, when you were, uh, you know, in your mid twenties, um, or maybe early twenties, how mentally did you adjust to now the standard being so high by yourself to where was it ever tough? Like, do you, do you practice anything like bro, self-talk wise or was that? Like it's, that's the whole thing is how do I get to the next level? Mentally, mm -hmm. That's what I've been yeah. going through over the past three months is yeah, I hit a PR, but my drive isn't how it used to be back in 2020 or back in mm -hmm. 2019. I'm just at a different level and you have to keep fighting your, I'm, I'm competing against myself yeah. to become greater, you know? So it's like, I'm trying to push myself. And, um, a lot of times it just, uh, you know, you get complacent is what happens. Yeah. You get complacent and you think that, you know, um, you've made it this far and there's far and you can continue to maintain at that point, And that's not the case. So to every great occasion, you have to rise for it. Mm -hmm. And I have to rise for this 805 pound bench press. Like, I have to rise above it like I've never risen before. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So, actually, one thing I want to ask you, too, is when, you're, when your doctor said the thing about the AC joint, was there, was there ever a moment where you thought you were finished as far as pursuing maximal strain on the bench, or did you straight up know, like, you're wrong immediately? I'm like, oh, this, ain't, this, ain't, this ain't for me. I already knew. Like, I knew from the moment. Like, I didn't, I didn't survive addiction. Um, I didn't survive shootouts. I didn't survive any of that stuff come up short and failed in absolutely not that's awesome absolutely not i'm i'm going to i didn't survive any of that stuff uh my one thing that, that keeps me going is my daughter i remember whenever before i broke the world record my daughter i would come home every day from work and my daughter would be like daddy when are you gonna be number one <laughs> and that thought alone that's <laughs> what got me the first world record that thought alone <laughs> so maybe i need to reiterate that back into my thought yeah. process the thought of my daughter saying that to me every single day now, she needs to put that pressure on you hey when are you gonna bench 805 <laughs> you need to right? that script yeah. i know right so um but i just think about main things like making my, my dad died in 2016 mm -hmm. my whole life i've tried to try to stride to try to make him happy or or be proud of me mm -hmm. and it was just some issues that i dealt with a long time ago but um mainly not just uh, not mainly but not just that but thinking about lifting up my community and yeah a lot of people count on me man a lot of people that have been that that was raised on the wrong side of the tracks and that are still living on the wrong side of the tracks look at me for inspiration people yeah. across the world in social media i yeah. get more love from people across the world in social media than my own hometown that people are like like literally i was about to commit suicide and you just posted a video up that was talking about my exact topic and um, I've been training in the gym for four weeks straight and I, I feel better than I've ever felt. And I'm just like, this is the impact that I'm having on the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's why I feel my cause is, and I'm not saying better than other people, but that's why I'm going to hit 805 is because yeah. this is not just about me. It's bigger <laughs> than that. Yeah. This is a big picture. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, yeah. So now I think we are nearly finished here because I, I don't have I have a few here written down on. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we covered pretty much everything. Like, uh, actually, this is a very specific one. Do you know if Eric Spoto and Kirill have any plans to compete again? Because nobody really knows so. about those two. You don't think I so? I don't think so. But by far, well, just to be honest, with this new Iranian coming, I'm telling mm -hmm. you, this dude is a stud. Mm -hmm. And if the, I'm not saying the weights weren't real, but if if they if they are real, 
he's going to be a force to reckon with. Not, I don't think, because Correll is too busy. Correll has a business. He has a whole different lifestyle. And in order for Correll to come back and do an 800 pound bench press, a lot of that stuff is going to have to go on the back burner. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. did you think, have you seen Correll? Look, if you go back today, look at Correll's picture where he's standing in some blue shorts with his, with his buddies. Mm -hmm. uh, they're outside in, like the snow and he's standing and like how cut up he is. Right. Mm -hmm. Then he just posted a picture of him back in 2014. Look at the size. Look at the difference. Okay. Are you looking at it right now? Yeah. I'll, I'll look back at that. I mean, so for that, that being said, like he's going to have to gain another hundred pounds, yeah. uh, 75 pounds. And it's just, it's not healthy, man. It's not yeah. healthy. Yeah, and that's that's the thing with with your eight oh five is it seems to me like even when you're dominating and you still I mean you're crushing everybody and the end of the day you're still racing against time because there's still that sliver of a window to where it's it's not just the fact that you're attempting eight oh five it's that you've built all of this momentum and it seems like the yep. moment that momentum leaves uh, uh, you know not to say necessarily would happen but a lot of times when yep. it leaves a lot of times it doesn't come back for a lot of guys once that that priority Absolutely. shifts. Absolutely. You're exactly right. So I guess time will tell, you know, time yeah. will tell and we'll figure it's it like out. It's like capture that so now and then you could just. Bro, I have to go. I have to use the restroom and I got a meeting I got to get to. All right. But, so, um, yeah, I appreciate it. We covered look everything. forward to doing the podcast soon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you for, for being on. And that's it. So make All sure to like the video. Subscribe. Peace to everyone. See ya. All right. Take care.